you can start this one. <laughs> uh, that's a great question. Um, the idea of, of game set I came off of, uh, I worked in an esports company, actually. Uh, I went on an internship. I was working downtown for an entrepreneur who was starting an esports company. And I just came across a lot of interesting uh, statistics around the industry. And at the same time, I just come off the back of uh, working for the Simon Fraser Student Society. I was the vice president of student life there. So for me, it was more so thinking, how can we leverage uh, esports, which is predominantly played by students in the, in the STEM, STEM students, right? So science, technology, engineering, mathematics students. Because when I was working at the SFSS, I identified a lot of these students weren't really involved in extracurricular activities. So esports was something that they did. And lo and behold, we realized there was a gap in the high school esports market in, uh, in Canada, but we started off in BC. So that was essentially how we started, yeah. Excellent. Um, really, really great to see that connection from working in industry and, and taking it out and then leaving something on your own. Uh, Christina, what was, what was your journey towards uh, Employee to Empower? Uh, I would say if I give a little bit of the question was, how did I come up with the idea mm -hmm. of power? Right. Okay. Uh, well, it started actually in the year of 2017, near the end of December, we were at uh, hosting our annual kind of street store, uh, which is something I, I, I took part in when I was in university. And it's a free pop-up clothing store for people in need. And we did it every Christmas as a way to, you know, uh, get to know the community a little bit better. And I've always been passionate about the community as since I was 14 years old. And so it was actually really through listening to the community because I think more so on the social entrepreneurship side, I didn't want to just come into a community and say, hey, here are some solutions or like, here's what I think will support people rather than doing that. We actually had some good conversations with what some of the barriers people were facing and how us as a community can benefit and add value to them. And so there was a family uh, that it, there was a specific scenario that actually kind of sparked the idea. And it was when um, there's a in the street store is kind of like a outdoor pop up shop, it's like kind of like a picture like an outdoor festival with like food, clothes. Um, things to eat and, um, and toiletries for people to choose what they want and need with dignity. And so there was a young boy that came sprinting through to the street store at 9 a.m. He was like, like most four years old. Um, and he, he was running at all of us volunteers and we were all just really confused as to why he was alone. And we thought maybe he knew somebody, but he didn't and he kept running and he started running in my direction. And I thought, okay, maybe I know this boy from before and he's getting closer, opening my hands. So like, you know, maybe he wants to give me a hug, but he ended up just like totally just sprinting past my armpit. And I was a little, I thought he wanted to hug me, but he didn't. Um, so he went to go to the toy tent basically and uh, to pick up some toys for himself for Christmas. Um, parents came by later on and just to say, um, thank you for you know keeping him company. And they actually said that, uh, you know, um, it's been hard for them to hold a steady income to afford a Christmas gift for Justin, the name of the boy. And, um, and they were looking, they, they were asking for long term support resources and would be interested in learning that. And so that kind of sparked the thought of, okay, well, how can we provide long term support um, that can support people for the long run rather than short term, uh, short term needs. And so that's kind of like where when I left my job to start Employed Empower, um, where we provide long-term ongoing support to entrepreneurs in the community. And yeah, it was really inspired by the community um, and my curiosity, like as a, as a kid, um, wondering, you know, why, why people are experiencing poverty and what kind of tools we can provide to support them. Oh, that's... Um... That's really great. I, I love the point on, you know, listening to the community and, and really making sure that you're kind of solving those real problems and how, how that was just such a natural fit from where you already were. Um, Renee, do you want to talk a little bit about where the idea for uh, Labora first came from? Yeah. Um, so I'm from Mexico and I came to Vancouver in 2017 to study the executive MBA program at the SFU. And during the program, I read some stories about uh, abuse of seasonal agricultural workers. And I was very lucky to know one of these workers back home. So I just like call him back and say, hey, I read this, like, can you talk a, a little bit more about how's the experience? How, how do you manage your, your, your stay in Canada? And then to hear his, his 
he's sharing what he has lived. Um, I found out that there was room to, to make some improvement, especially in the financial aspect of the seasonal workers. And then that's why I came with the idea that we could do the, the, the helping them with the financial conditions, do the process of remit the money in a better uh, exchange rate, lower fees, and make it faster and safe. Um, and that's that's the way that Labora was born. I, I, I shared the idea with two of my friends and classmates at the, at the MBA program. And we decided to to make labor, and that's that's the way everything starts. Great. Okay. So now you're at, you're at the point where uh, you know you're out living your life, and you and you have this idea for this entrepreneurial venture that you want to go out and start. Um, what kind of convinced you to take that next step? Because I think you hear a lot, you know, of people who kind of come up with that initial startup idea or say they want to be an entrepreneur, sort of thing. Um, what convinced you to take that first step into going past that idea and turning your startup into something of a reality? Um, Christina, why don't we start with you this time? I'm just putting some thought because I was actually in a corporate job first and I had just been a fresh graduate. I was doing um, event planning at a, at a, at a corporation and I think because, you know, growing up, I'd always been someone like who was always asked why. And, and one of the things that my parents never answered um, was like, you know, the question about homelessness. And so, you know, all throughout school, I had always wanted, like had this quest to like want to do something in social services. And um, I was also, you know, I also had parental expectations that I would complete my degree and then get a full-time job that I had benefits and to kind of keep me financially sane. Um, but throughout my experience working in corporate world, I, I did notice that I started not having as much time volunteering in the community as much as I used to. And I noticed that I, I noticed that with work culture, I wanted to create a, I wanted to be in an environment that was psychologically safe, but it just, at the current environment that I was working for at the time didn't really align with that. Um, and so I did manage to still volunteer like alongside my job and I think it was actually like, it was the turning point was actually meeting that young boy that I talked to you about earlier um, that really just did it for me. It really gave me perspective. And I actually ended up hearing that same kind of narrative over and over. So the fact that you hear it five plus times, like it, it really it starts to mean something. And I think with my experience and just the trust that I had built with the community, I thought, well, you know, wh why not try? And, and I felt like it was something that made me feel really energized and alive. And I didn't feel that <laughs> working in a corporate world. It's not to say it's bad. Um, I just think that uh, it wasn't for me and I, I wasn't really like the best in school. Um, I was more so, you know, better in the community as well and somehow graduated. Um, but yeah, I would say the turning point was just hearing the need over and over again and um, just taking that leap and it was scary. My parents were in Hong Kong and I, at the time, maybe that was scheduled <laughs> because if I did that while they were here, I would have gone into so much more deeper trouble. But anyway, that's a little bit of context just to like what the turning point was. Thanks. Bro. Right. Um, uh, uh, that's a really great story. Uh, Renee, what about you? You know, you come to Canada, you're going to get this executive MBA and I'm sure the expectation out of that is, well, you're going to get some high paying, fancy executive job. Uh, after you had the idea for Labora, what, what convinced you that, hey, this is something I'm, I'm gonna pursue with, with all my effort and energy? Well, um, I, I think that being at this stage of an executive program is like, um, I was doing like kind of corporate and, and government jobs before. So it was it was a nice stage to, to do some pivot and, and start a, a, a company. And, and the good thing about the process is like, it was at the same, at the same time of taking the MBA program. It, it's, it was also about doing the due diligence um, uh, and find out if we have a really, a, a really, um, a really problem to solve that, that needs a solution. And we invest a lot of time in the due diligence. I remember going back to Mexico and, and having interviews with government officials, with more workers back in Canada with some farmers. And see, there was a need to solve because the program, the, this program for, for bringing seasonal workers has been there for 50 years and, and nothing has changed in, in those, those years. I mean, the program was even before computers. So 
our, our due diligence, it was about to find out if we can provide value and, and if there were customers and if there was a need to be solved and help the, the, the whole ecosystem. So we used to take those years to, to, to go a little bit deeper in this, in this research. I think that's a really good point that you, that you bring up, Renee, right? Like a, a lot of the times, uh, entrepreneurship is viewed as, as this really risky endeavor, um, whether that's internally or maybe, Christina, maybe that was your parents' view sort of thing. But if you do that due diligence that Renee was talking about, that customer discovery, really understanding your market, really understanding that problem that you're solving, um, it really de-risks it. So that way, by the time you're ready to jump in with two feet, uh, you know that what you're working on is, is already pretty solid and, and you haven't risked much just going out there and talking to users and understanding their problems. Uh, Tawanda, what about you? Once you had the idea for Game Setup, uh, what convinced you to take that next step and go and run with it? Um, I think for me, it was a bit different from Christina and Renee. I kind of just dived in. Um, I, I looked at the opportunity in the market and like I, I had a good feeling about what I was working on. And, uh, and I'd, uh, I, have, I have a really good co-founder, Rana. He's a very good friend of mine. And we just, we just got to work. Uh, we, just, we just knew that there's a really big opportunity here. We were convinced. I think the main thing for us was just convincing ourselves and just blocking out all the other noise. We didn't really care about like whatever we're gonna hear outside. We kind of convinced ourselves that this is an opportunity. Uh, we've seen the model somewhat work in the US uh, when PlayVS had tried to do it and they were having problems doing it in Canada. Uh, we changed a few things and we came across a lot of problems, but we just knew that we just have to, we set goals, we tracked against and executed against those goals. And then we just kept on growing slowly every month, every week. Uh, yeah, we came through a few roadblocks. We were just like, oh, maybe some things are not gonna work, but we knew if we just kept on, uh, if we persevered, I think we just knew that, okay, we're gonna get to, we're gonna get somewhere uh, really, really far with this, uh, for sure. It's a, it's a really interesting uh, perspective on it. Uh, so now at this point in your entrepreneurial journey, you know, you have your idea, um, you're ready to kind of go for it. Let's, let's switch tracks a little bit and talk a little bit more about the idea prize competition, because I think about half of the people registered for this event our current idea prize competitors this year. Um, for those of you who don't know, idea prize is part of the Coast Capital Savings Venture Prize that we won each year. It's the largest entrepreneurship competition here at FSU. There's over $75,000 in prizes most years. And I think this year we're really excited because it's our 10th anniversary that we've been able to um, run this competition. Uh, and so for everyone who enters that competition, you're then, uh, uh, streamed into two different categories. You have your venture stream, and this is for more of the uh, established and operating startup, startups who have a little bit of revenue coming in or are working uh, kind of alongside with customers and they've had their solution developed. And then we have uh, the idea stream competitors. And these are for the earliest of early stage uh, companies who, you know, there's no minimum bar to uh, enter the competition and come and pitch. If you're part of the SFU community, we want to hear your idea. We want to provide you some feedback um, and help you grow your venture. So uh, I want to hear from each of you a little bit about uh, how maybe you first find out about the idea competition, what your competition uh, experience was like, and uh, what the best piece of advice you have is for uh, current competitors. And I can see Christina is thinking again, so I won't pick on her to go first. So uh, Tawanda, what are your thoughts on uh, the idea competition, your experience and advice for this year's competitors? Oh, I think the idea competition played a extremely important role in uh, validating uh, internally myself and Rana, understanding that, okay, maybe we were uh, onto something to a degree. Also, it played a really great role in terms of pushing us to actually like ask ourselves uh, the tough questions uh, and actually like actually figure out like, it was actually our first time actually pitching to, um, I think it's the first round we pitched in, I think it's in Surrey in the boardroom, right? The, yeah, the Coast Capital Savings boardroom uh, where we pitched our, I think, it's, I think it was a 60 second pitch there. And then that was our first time pitching to uh, people that weren't like our friends or anything. and. After we did that, um, that 
provided us with a bit more like uh, encouragement to be like, oh, they were like, it was really hard, like talking to like, uh, uh, like uh, I'll say like older people telling them, oh, I want your children to play video games. It's a sport. So that was like pretty interesting. Uh, I enjoyed that experience. But after winning the competition and going through, I think going through the competition is the most important piece because as we went through the competition, refining the pitch decks, getting access to the mentors, uh, that really helped us a lot. And uh, I think after winning the competition, it helped us in the initial conversations with uh, the government officials in BC, uh, that helped a lot for us. So really grateful on, on that part, for sure. Right, and then if you had a, a piece of advice for this year's competitors, uh, what would it be as we gear up towards preliminary pitches next week? Uh, piece of advice, um, I, I, I personally don't focus a lot of attention on the actual pitch deck. I just use it as like a, like a, like a, like prompts, but I think you really need to understand your idea and your business and really uh, be able to like, come use, the, I use them as like a, like a, like a, just the, like something that looks good. So people who don't have context can like refer to, but I think you really need to be passionate about what you're talking about. The judges can see that. Uh, and then don't be afraid to not know the answer. I wasn't afraid. I had a notebook and when I was getting told, or well, maybe I didn't know what I was talking about in certain things. I wrote everything they told me down and I used all those things. So it was pretty helpful at the end of the day. Uh, yeah, so I'd say having an open mindset, taking in a notebook and actually like, don't try to like respond to their questions, just listen, because you're getting free, free, free advice uh, from really smart people. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's a really good piece of advice and something I, I would certainly echo for all competitors is if during the Q&A portion of your preliminary pitch, one of the judges asks you a question uh, and you don't know the answer, we know that you're early stage. The judges know that you're early stage, right? They would much rather see you say, you know, that's a really great question. It's something that we're still in the midst of exploring or it's something that we're going to explore. Uh, thanks so much for your feedback. Uh, that's a really great answer. It's much better than trying to convince the judges you know something when uh, maybe you're, you don't totally know what you're talking about uh, for that specific question because you know they, these experienced judges they're they're going to see right through that uh, and they'd much rather see you as an entrepreneur who uh, is honest and is going to go out there and do the work. Um, Christina, what about you? Do you want to talk a little bit about your um, idea prize experience, especially coming in as a nonprofit and winning the whole thing and, and what advice you would give to this year's competitors. Yeah, I, I'm having some intense nostalgic moments because that was three years ago and and it was cool to kind of see where we are today and the little growth pivots that we've been taking all the time. And to be honest, in the beginning, I was quite intimidated. Like, I'll, I'll be honest with you all. I, you know, being, uh, I was, my background is in psychology and I have a specialization in um, disability applied behavior analysis. And that's a therapeutic um, approach for people with autism. And so I thought, oh, well, I got, I feel like I, only, I don't really have the business background. I only have a psychology background. And I remember I actually sat down with uh, Sarah, Sarah Lubick um, for coffee at Nemesis. And I was so nervous. It was my first time meeting her. And, but I got connected to talk to her about my idea. And she actually, that's how I heard about Idea Prize. She was you know, even hearing that I didn't have any business background, pitching background, she was still very much like, you can do it. I think you can do it. Just, just ask for help, ask for mentors, mentorship. And, um, and she just had this like, like belief and confidence that like we could do it. And so I remember I had, I doubted myself over and over and over. Cause I thought, well, she told me the pitch was two minutes. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm a storyteller. I, I can maybe talk minimum five minutes, but somehow I managed to use a two minute pitch with them. Um, and what I did is actually talk to some idea prize winners in the past um, and just like really came in with a sincere ask of, you know, some advice that I could take. So I'm happy to talk to anybody here who's like wanting to, you know, pitch for the prize too. Um, the experience itself, I feel like definitely was a sweaty one. I was nervous, <laughs> but had so much support um, from from mentors. And, and that's also another piece, like advice of like, you know, don't be afraid to ask for help because every single person that I've asked, like if I come from a way that's respectful, um, most people, if they can't give you too much time, they'll give you 30 minutes. And that is such like, such great um, in, in insights to, to support your pitch. Um, I, I agree with Tawanda in the sense of like, you know, like the passion has to be there. I think the slides are supportive, but also have passion with a load of research. Like 
because the questions do come and um, it's really important to show that you've already done, like having, I had an appendix after my pitch so that if the question came up, it showed that I was prepared and I would go down to that slide and say, oh, like, yeah, here's the answer to your question that I was anticipating already. And that shows respect. When you prepare, it shows respect that, that you are taking this seriously. Um, and yeah, I, I have a memory of finishing my pitch and then handing over the clicker to Janice, but then realizing the clicker was soaked in my palm sweat. <laughs> and so I remember wiping it off my pants and saying, here you go, Janice. It was a really, it was a really fun memory, but all to say it was exhilarating um, at the same time. And, um, and yeah, my advice would, I think my the one stuff that I've learned is, um, you know, if you don't have the background, it's okay. Um, I think asking people to make connections to, to, to people who might be able to mentor you is, is, is huge. Um, so yeah, I think that's, those are my thoughts for now. Thanks, thanks Christina. Um, uh, it's so great that, that you, you brought up your background because I think that's something that everyone at uh, Venture Connection and the Chang Institute uh, and across SFU believes so much in is that uh, entrepreneurs can come from anywhere. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter uh, what skills you, you may have had in a previous career, previous school or whatever, right? Entrepreneurship is, is more about mindset. And then we are here to help you develop that mindset and develop those skills. And, and Christina's right. There are people out there who um, are willing to give their time. Uh, I think everyone who has gone on an entrepreneurial journey can shout out uh, to mentors and, and people who have helped them out along the way. And then uh, as a nice little bonus for competitors this year, uh, it's all being done virtually. So you don't need to worry about handing a sweaty clicker to uh, one of the staff members or judges at the end of your pitch. So if you're, if you're, if you're sweating it, it's just over Zoom, the quality's not that high on the webcam. I'm sure we'll never know this year. Um, Renee, what about your experience uh, with Idea Prize and going through that process and advice you would have for competitors this year? Yeah, I, I mean, for me, it has been an amazing experience. I think it's, it's, it's as much as worth as the MBA itself. Like, um, like for us, it was, it was about validating our idea to have different inputs on opinions because usually you fall in love sometimes with your solution and, and, and having another view, it's, it's, it's very important, especially at the beginning because also your value proposition might change like, or, or my polish uh, as you, you might start with an idea, but once when you go to the market and get customers and they are starting paying you for, for your services and they even have another services that you didn't even notice at the first time and you are just pivoting all your time to, 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 to satisfy your, your customers needs. So uh, I think uh, I will encourage to, to everybody to, to do the idea prize because I think that's the first step of the journey, like to validate the idea, to expose your idea. And then if, 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 you, if, if the participants go further, it, they can go to, to the other stage, like the venture prize and go back and say, hey, this was our experience. These are our customers revenues like like it's, it's it's all the time about evolving so i think the idea price is fantastic i think it's it's, it's a, an incredible way to start the journey to have amazing feedback from from the professor executives in residence mentors and and then go to your company and and then go back and say hey we made it or we changed it or we pivoted like i think there's a lot of value and 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 this, this initial competition, it's, it's very important in that long journey. Uh, and then advice for people competing this year? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Like, like I encourage to everyone to do it. Like sometimes people are hesitating what's the right moment to go to, to a competition. I think that as, as soon as, as, as anyone is, has some validation of the idea, go to pitch the idea to, to, to judges, to, to, to executives in racing because they have different backgrounds that may support or, or, or giving new feedback to, to, to whatever company is pitching. And then also they are saving time because if, if it's going to fly or not, it's better to have some advice at the beginning that just spending too much without having like any kind of traction. So I really encourage to everybody to, to go there, pitch their ideas and, 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 and 
and build this awareness in the startup ecosystem in BC. I think the Venture Connection is an amazing opportunity for, for doing that. Okay, so now you're in the competition. Oh yeah, go ahead, Christina. So, so sorry, is it okay to just jump in real quick? Just like yeah, listen to Renee speak. Um, I was just reflecting on what I was talking about earlier and I realized I talked about sweat for a long time, but I didn't get a chance to talk about um, like, like what Renee and Tawanda was saying about the resources. Um, I must say, you know, even following the idea prize, like it was really cool because I got access to a mentor who was like this cool unicorn blend of someone who knew charities really well. And he was also skilled in business development. So it really, that, that was like the biggest, um, win, I would say, like really just having a mentor have your back and like, like walk you through alongside all the operational challenges and the moments of doubt and success is like, that was that was that was like one of the most memorable things that I, ha I have um, being with Venture Connection and, and just really generous like with their resources as well. And it, it seriously really did help grow the charity over these past three years. So just wanting to say that like it, by joining the Venture Connection and also like competing, it does open like a plethora of doors for um, support. So yeah, I highly encourage. Okay, I'm done. Sorry, Will. <laughs> Oh, no. Uh, thanks, Christina. Yeah, you know, it, it's one of those things where, you know, a lot of people enter Idea Prize because they think the, the small cash prize that the top overall winner gets, right? That's what they're really after. Um, and don't get me wrong, cash is very helpful uh, when starting a venture, but, but we hear that story over and over again because one of the other top prizes of if you win Idea Prize is um, we bring you on as an incubator client to Coast Capital Savings Venture Connection. Uh, and at the heart of what we do at uh, the incubator is we're a business mentorship program, right? So at any given point, we have somewhere between 10 and 12 mentors and residents who um, have a, a wide range of experiences and, and, and specialties. And so you're, you're assigned a lead mentor, but you can reach out to any of the other 10 and, and they'll provide uh, some time to, to spend with you and work with you on your idea and, and help you get to that next step and, and hopefully uh, open even more doors for you. Um, Tawanda, do you want to talk a little bit about your experience? So now you've won Idea Prize and, and the rocket ship is starting to take off. Uh, what was that like? Um, that was, a, I would say for, like, for me, it was a very uh, fast process. Uh, a lot of things just started happening, especially because of COVID-19. So the COVID-19 pandemic really accelerated the uh, desire of and really shifted the preferences of uh of like the perceptions i would say towards uh online gaming from a lot of parents a lot of schools so for us it was more so like um uh, we're getting a lot of like inbound uh calls from like schools asking us like um do you have an esports program can we get this esports all the way from toronto had a school in europe contact us as well uh so a lot of things were happening but at the same time we had to like uh like uh, re-strategize and like figure out what we needed to do within the short term for us to like really be able to like take advantage of that long-term upside. So what, what I'm trying to say about that and when I'm saying this is that um, COVID-19 changed a lot for us and uh, we were able to secure a deal with uh, BC School Sports, uh, which basically initially allowed us to have the exclusive rights and operator of esports in every single high school in uh, BC, that really was a game changer for us. Uh, and the interesting thing there is that we were at the weird point where we we're trying to raise capital and also trying to raise capital, we're also trying to build the product and also build the product, but also not lose customers because you have something that people want, but if you can't meet the demand, someone's gonna come into that market and service that market. But fortunately we had the exclusive rights, so, yeah, it was like a whole interesting um, uh, process there. Uh, a lot of sleepless nights, uh, but I enjoyed it. I still enjoy it today. Uh, the rocket ship is getting faster and faster. And uh, Ron and I are really excited about the opportunity to be able to uh, be really build out esports in schools alongside with Delane at Play Versus. Uh, with, uh, we have a lot of resources now and we're in a pretty good position, I would say right now. Yeah, I, I want to dig a little bit deeper here, just because uh, I, I think what you talked about is really interesting. Let's go back to, you know, when it's just game setup and you were trying to do all those different things. And just so the audience here knows, 
uh, when you were trying to do the sales and build the product and raise capital and, and all those other all that other fun stuff, how, how many people were on your team? Three. Three. Yeah. Three. That's what I thought. Yeah. Um, so you know, yeah. there's lots going on. There's only a few people. You haven't raised any significant capital yet, so it's not like you have a ton of cash in the bank where you can go and you know hire more people and more devs and all that stuff. Can you talk a little bit about with all these um, uh, competing activities for your very limited resources, how did you decide where you were going to focus your time and how much you were going to focus? And because you know that's one of the characteristics of entrepreneurship is, is you have these very limited resources. Um, mm -hmm. And so how did you as a team decide what to focus on? Yeah, I think the most limited resource is like you mentioned was time. Um, there was no time, like I had no time, like uh, at all. Uh, Rana came up with, uh, Rana is an engineer, he's my co-founder. He realized that like we were dealing with a lot of things and then we automated all of our processes. We automated our lives. We used the software known as Jira. It's, it's a really useful like project management tool. Uh, Rana had used it in the past. So it really allowed us to prioritize and automate uh, all of, I literally automated my entire life and it would tell me what I need to do at certain points. But I think another thing that was really important is really trying to figure out what was really, really, really important. And I always used to ask myself is, if I don't do this, what's going to kill the business in the next few days? Uh, so, and I knew that I needed to raise capital. Uh, and I knew if I didn't have capital, I wasn't going to be able to like bring on more people to like help me because I'm one person and the other two of us can't do everything. So I would spend probably 45% of my time early mornings uh, in downtown Vancouver, uh, talking to investors, uh, meeting with them, but also not trying to spend a lot of time talking to them because sometimes a lot of them just want a lot of attention and like they probably not gonna cut a check, but they just wanna like talk to you about your idea or something. So having to like raise capital because it takes a lot of time, I realized. I thought it was about raise capital in like two months. I realized that is so unrealistic. I think it was you, Will, who told me you're joking. You're not going to raise that type of money in like one month. And then uh, I was like, no, there's no way. I was a bit stubborn. And then I realized I was just like, Will was right. <laughs> there's no way I'm going to raise. I want to raise a million dollars. And Will was like, you're joking. <laughs> you're kidding me. Well, but, uh, uh, I, I think it worked yeah. out pretty well for you anyways. Um, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's so tough when you're in the, uh, the, those, those early days where, um, you know, do you spend your time moving the business forward with sales and building out operations? But if you know at some point you need to raise capital, building those relationships with investors, um, it, it's really tough to balance. But uh, pulling it back to uh, after Idea Prize, Renee, so when you won Idea Prize, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, what happened afterwards and did it meet your expectations? Did you have expectations for what your life was going to look like as you were starting out as, on this entrepreneurial journey? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first I started like after, after we won the idea prize, we, we felt like really nice. Like I, I, we thought that we have something to, to fight. And, and then we, we did all the steps, like we, we, we did the, some part of the idea prize money, we incorporated Labora, so we incorporated the company. Then we do the, the, we obtained the government authorization in our case, because it was financial transactions, we obtained FinTech authorization. Then we um, built a, a, a subsidiary in Mexico. Then we um, built a platform. We, we, we brought a friend to, to, to be our acting CTO. So he developed the platform for, for Labora. Then we do, um, last year we did pilots in, in BC and Quebec. And this year we started operations in, in BC. So it has been a, like a kind of a long journey. Um, we, we have been trying to do it like, like the old school way, like, like get customers and, and get revenues. And then after we, our idea is to have six um, a six month action, and then go to pitch for for looking for for seed investment. But we want to be able to prove that we have sales and customers. So that's that's that has been our journey. And about the expectations, uh, I mean, it has been amazing. Like like being able to be in Venture Connection, 
Um, that and, and and we were very lucky to to have uh, as our mentor Dave Thomas. So he connected with with another mentor at Foresight, and then um, we are we were able to 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 reach the BC Agriculture Council in, in, in and and the Wally Initiative in in BC. Uh, we were able to participate in the BC Agri Innovation Program. Like, like there's a lot of things happened since 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 the idea price. And we found out that the, the word of mouth is, is it's so important, the networking is so important. And that was the kind of, uh, um, among many things, the, the value that we, we got from, from Venture Connection was, was this reference to, to more people that are in the agriculture ecosystem, in the startup ecosystem. And we were able to leverage on those connections and grow Labora. So, we were very happy because that was because of venture connection. So the program is, is it's amazing, not just for the feedback about how develop and evolve the company, but also to reach potential investors and customers. And there's a great value that. Well, that's all right. we, we always love hearing um, uh, companies uh, say nice things about our uh, our incubator here. It's a, it's a, it's a great place to work and it's, it's a great place to be. Um, so just being cognizant of time here, uh, I have two quick questions that we're going to bundle together uh, before we'll open it up to the audience uh, so they can ask their own questions. Uh, question number one, uh, what are you most excited about for the future of your company? And question number two, uh, best piece of general advice uh, for the aspiring entrepreneurs in the audience here today? Uh, so what are you most excited about for the future of your company? And if you could give just one piece of advice uh, to, on, to the aspiring entrepreneurs in the audience today, what would it be? Um, Renee, why don't, why don't we start with you? What are you most excited about for Labora? Yeah, well, now we are at this year, we're in that stage, like um, we want to scale Labora in, in, in BC. We want to scale across Canada in, in, in the next year. And our dream is to do the crossover to the US because the agriculture ecosystem is 10 times the US because of their size and the population and also the seasonal workers that are in the US. So we are, I think we are trying to achieve that, that traction starting in Canada and then to the cross border to the US. So that's our expectations in the, in the near future. And, and about the piece of advice, as I mentioned, like, like if I were a new entrepreneur with, with a new idea or company, I encourage everybody to, to go to the Venture Connection Prize, to go to the idea prize, to pitch the, their idea, uh, to get feedback, to start getting some traction and to use all the SFU ecosystem, which is amazing. Like, like you, in, in, a, in, in, in a real world, you will need to have an, an amazing board with several advisors have the power of having that in-house at SFU. So I will encourage to everybody to leverage on, on, on the Venture Connection program and start that journey uh, uh, as soon as possible and get that amazing feedback, word of mouth, referrals, networking, that all are the main, the, 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 the great value of, of the Venture Connection program. Uh, thanks, Renee. Uh, it looks like Tawanda has stepped away. So we'll go to Christina. What are you most excited about for what comes next with Employ to Empower and, and the pieces of advice for the uh, aspiring entrepreneurs in today's audience? Uh, first two words that come to mind are doors of opportunity. Um, and I had a thought of like, you know, imagine inviting someone to your home without having a real door, you know, they can't really come inside. And like, likewise, I apply that same concept to people who face barriers. And, you know, there's always a stereotype of like, people are lazy, like they just, they should just get a job, but, or they should try and find opportunities to help themselves. But it's really hard to do that without having doors of opportunities, let alone even showing people where that is. So I'm really excited to be able to uh, provide those doors of opportunities, be it taking a course with us, taking mentorship with us and having, and having them walk, choose on their own what they wanna walk through the door with us. And so um, what I'm really excited about as well is the education and awareness that I want to share like with the world about you know, some of the common uh, stigma that exists and how we can be active change agents in, in challenging that in our everyday conversations um, and challenging it with empathy. And so even things like language, the language that we use, you know, like things like addicts, junkies, um, bums, 
hobos, like things like that. Like how can we um, proactively change and correct, challenge our language? Because that is one of the biggest ingredients towards stigma. And I speak passionately about this because, um... okay, hold on. Breathe, breathe, breathe. Okay, so one of our program entrepreneurs in our, in, at Impotent Empower um, is responsible for removing human waste. And basically he was called to, um, called for a job at a business to remove the waste. And um, that individual had showed up and basically wanted to um, ask where they can remove the waste. They're called Team Crap Trapper. And the business owner um, uh, basically was really questioning him and saying, oh, like, it doesn't look like you're here to remove the waste and just really just challenging and being skeptical about this individual. And he's also a proud resident in the downtown east side as well. And so he eventually um, he, he ended up spraying him in the face with water and telling him to go away uh, just because of just because of the way he looked. And it was it was really it was actually a really um, horrifying experience. And it drove a lot of like anger and passion in me that there needs to be more education and awareness about how we can work with people who face barriers and and, and not just discriminate. Um, and so those are two things that I'm really passionate about. Sorry, I got a little bit emotional. Um, and a piece of advice to answer your question on that side is, um, I would say it doesn't, the idea doesn't have to be perfect for it to start because we did a pivot as well. Um, and that pivot happened through collaborating with other nonprofits that were in the similar field as us. So I would, I would encourage people, if you have an idea, um, don't work in your own silo. I would say, try and find other people who are doing similar things as you. So for us, we, at first we were trying to connect people to employment. And so we connected with Eastside Works, which is a wonderful charity in the Denton Eastside and learn, pick their brains about how they connect people to work. And it seems like they're doing a good job. So we pivoted towards supporting entrepreneurs. And um, now they refer people to us um, and we refer people to them. It's like this beautiful collaboration. So that's a piece of uh, a thought that I, I felt like was really helpful and isn't just isn't done enough because of the fear of competition. Um, but we ended up supporting more people by talking to more by talking to people in our industry. So just starting even if it's not perfect because it will change <laughs> and being okay with that. So yeah, that's, that's I'm done now. <laughs> Thanks, Christina. Uh, so Tawanda, your position is, is also very unique in that in less than a year after winning Idea Prize, uh, your company has been acquired and you're now part of this uh, much larger organization. Uh, so the two questions are, what are you most excited about next in your entrepreneurial journey? And if you had one piece of advice for the aspiring entrepreneurs in the audience members, and then just before Tawada answers, uh, audience members, if you have questions for the panel, get them into the chat now and uh, we'll be sure to get to them as, as soon as Tawanda's done with his answer. Um, in terms of, uh, it's maybe. Okay, good. Uh, excitement. Um, I'm really excited. Um, I mean, I'm, I get excited every day because I just get to see like how this massive um, company works. Uh, Playversive has raised around $100 million. They're also backed by SoftBank. So that's pretty cool. Uh, so I just, I'm learning so much. I have access to like things I never thought I would ever see in my life. So that excites me every day. Um, and the CEO is amazing, uh, provides us with a lot of opportunities to like uh, play with a lot of stuff, uh, build whatever we think we should be building. Uh, at such a young age, that's important as well, newer development. So that's really uh, cool as well. Um, and uh, in terms of advice, I think for me, it's uh, the biggest advice I give to myself and to anyone is like slow and steady wins the race. I set, uh, I set small goals and I just try to like figure out things bit by bit. I don't try to like uh, create the whole company at the same time. I just try to like, I try to like achieve two small things every day. And then at the end of the week, I've done like 14 really cool things. It kind of like helps me like uh, stop uh, working long, long hours. So that's, that's, what, that's kind of like my piece of advice. There was like try to like do things slowly. Don't try to like build the whole company in one day. I tried that before. Uh, it's not it's not it's not the best experience, I would say. Yeah, but yeah, that's my piece of advice. Okay, uh, thanks, Wanda. Uh, we have our first question uh, from the audience here. So um, uh, any of the panelists, uh, feel free to jump in on this one. Uh, how were you able to put together a team uh, to assist and, and support you on on your journey? Oh, 
Oh, okay, go ahead, if I can jump on that. Um, in, in our case, I, I was very lucky to, to have these classmates that they were, um, they have different backgrounds. They were at the same program, the, at the, at the executive MBA. So they got in so very enthusiastic about the idea of developing this, this, this idea of helping seasonal workers as a business. So you can, my, uh, what I'm trying to say is you can look around at, at your classmate at this view and there's a lot of value in your own cohort to, to build something. Uh, Christina, and any advice to the entrepreneurs in the audience who are, are building out uh, either their initial founding team or looking to bring on a, a first few employees? Are these, would you say like volunteers or like paid staff or what, what um, kind of that be? Yeah, the question just says, how are you able to put together a team? Uh, so you can kind of interpret that whatever you'd like. You know, you, you can talk about co-founders, you could talk about volunteers, you could talk about paid staff. Um, mm -hmm. Well, you know, what, one thing that worked really well for us was we had events and a lot of talent came from the attendees. So like generally that's kind of like a, a good place to look for people who might be interested in um, your work because they're already coming to an event that you're hosting. Like for us, it was a fundraiser, actually seeing Rachel in the crowd. I think she, she, she's, she came to our event three years ago and I reconnected with her during like today, just that's awesome. Um, and uh, I think that could be an effective way because that way people are coming to you. And I think you can also headhunt in the way of maybe if you're an SFU student, like asking um, professors to share the word, um, asking mentors to share within their networks. I find that warm introductions and referrals are really effective. Um, so yeah, I would, I think that's kind of what worked um, for me, like whether it's like an event you want to host to kind of jumpstart and, and fundraise for your idea. Like generally people are quite supportive and people do show up. Um, so those are my initial thoughts. Might have more later. Okay. Uh, and we do have a, a clarif question from a clarification from our, our question answer. Uh, they're, they're specifically looking for advice on how do you go about finding your co-founders. Uh, so Tawanda, uh, any thoughts on, on putting together that, that co-founding team? Yeah, um, you're going to spend 99% of your life with uh, these people. So uh, I think it's a very important, uh, a lot of people just usually just, most people just say that because my, my background is in business. I'll say like, that's my strength. Uh, and lots, a lot of people look at it and say, oh, I need someone who's good at uh, tech or who can like build software or something. I think you need to dig a little bit deeper and like really see like, um, are your long-term goals aligned? Um, Rana is very technical, but at the same time, uh, I could leave him with the entire business and he can take over the entire business side of things. I'm also very proactive. When it comes to like understanding the technical side of things, I took a few coding classes, uh, a bunch of like other things as well. But I think besides just the skills, I think your relationship is more important and your skills and alignment on your long term goals. I think that was like really, uh, really helpful for myself and Rana. Uh, we know every I think your business partner or co-founders will know everything about you. They will know your finances. They'll know things about your family. So you have to be. Um, you have to be um, really, um, you have to take time uh, to actually understand and try to like uh, uh, learn more about the people you want to uh, bring on as your co-founders. It helped for me because Rana was a friend of mine in the past. Uh, yeah, so that, 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 that helped us a lot. Yeah, that's a really good point, Tawanda. Um, you know, not, not just having that, uh, the complementary skill set, but really having that uh, long-term goal and long-term vision alignment for, for what you're all working towards. Uh, super, super important when picking a co-founder. Um, so just for the sake of time, let's do one more quick question and then we'll wrap it up. Um, but I'm going to stay around after the event officially ends. So if you have any more questions, um, I'm, I'm going to stick around. Uh, but just finally, uh, favorite book or recommended reading for the audience here today, if everyone just wants to list one. Um, great, great by choice, uh, really good book. 
it's like a second version of a uh, good to great good to great was the first book by jim collins i really like the other one it's called great by choice it's really it talks a lot about uh return on luck how like you, you're you pushing yourself to get into different situations actually increases your return on luck so just going out as opposed to like staying in and going and coming to an event like this you might meet someone who could change your life and your trajectory so i really like that one yeah uh, Christina, a uh, quick entrepreneurial book recommendation. Oh, Renee, it looks like you're ready to go. Uh, Renee, do you have a quick entrepreneurial book recommendation? Yeah, I, I, I don't remember exactly the name, but it's an amazing book about um, lean startups. Um, it's, it's not very long. I think it's like 140 pages, I remember. And it's about all the time about focusing on value and, and, and keep your, your, start, your startup very lean because sometimes you, you might lose time or invest in things that you don't need to. So this is it's a very good book. Um, I would like to post it, but it's about Lean Startup or something like that. That's that's kind of the name. Yeah, I think, I think the name is Lean Startup. Uh, yeah. a really great book. Uh, Christina, what about you? I have two. One for mental health would be Burnout <laughs> by uh, I believe Dr. Emily Nagoski. And then the second one, because I was starting the charity with no funding, I, I, I really love the hundred dollar startup. Um, and I have that, I, I can put that in the chat right now, just really teaching you how to be resourceful. Um, because sometimes you just got to make do with what you have, especially if you're in the social entrepreneurship field and in early days. So that's me. Great. Uh, thanks, Christina. And, and thank you to the uh, entire panel uh, for joining us here today as we're uh, just about to wrap up. Uh, before we wrap up, uh, I have to give uh, a, a big shout out to uh, Coast Capital Savings. Um, you know, this is the Coast Capital Savings Speaker Series event. Um, we talked a lot about Coast Capital Savings Venture Prize and the Coast Capital Savings Venture Connection Incubator Program. Um, they've been a wonderful partner for us for all things entrepreneurship uh, here at SFU. Uh, and it's with their help and, and their resources that we're able to uh, put on events like this, uh, you know, keep mentoring young entrepreneurs through the incubator program uh, and, and have this annual competition where we get to bring uh, the whole university together uh, around entrepreneurship and, and support even more. So big thank you to them as well. Uh, with that, uh, we're going to conclude the event. Uh, as I said, I'm going to stick around. So if you have any questions about uh, ways to get involved or get support around entrepreneurship here at the university. I'll be here for another 10 or 15 minutes or so. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Renee, Christina, Tawanda, for coming and sharing your stories. And uh, good luck to everyone participating uh, and, and in the preliminary pitches next week for Venture Prize. Thank you, William. Thank you. Thank you.